dark, and you need the flashlight to get around. Uh, give me a hand. We want to have the environment be really dark, but also at the same time have colorful surfaces that are sort of hidden, so when a flashlight hits one of those, it bounces off onto the ceiling. If you shine a line on a red wall, it will bounce the red lighting of the whole environment. And it's very difficult to do, very expensive, but we did it. Everything should have a bounce lighting, otherwise the world is going to feel dry and unrealistic. I guess this is where the assholes sleep. I mean, slept. This engine is really driven in a way towards a very high level of cinematic control over each frame. And hopefully, if we achieve our goal, you'll see it is beautiful. There are these truly beautiful moments amid all this chaos and destruction. Yeah, once we're done with this whole thing, we can teach you how to play guitar. What do you say, huh? It looks like that's a counterweight. Okay. The story really dictates sort of the arc of the overall pacing. Storytelling would always want to be subtle. They would always want to keep the, the world grounded in reality. But gameplay has requirements where the player needs to see this thing. The player needs to immediately know that the enemy is attacking, that this room is dangerous, that this room is a puzzle that you have to solve. What are the things that we can do on the joystick to make you feel the same way that these characters are gonna feel when we get to this next pinch point in the story? There's a turn in a scene that we need these characters to take and we need you to feel it or understand that and that means you have to play it. Make sure that there's that contrast between the negative space and then the high tension spikes. A lot of times we won't play music or we'll play very minimal music just to let you know kind of the state whether you're still in stealth or combat has broken out. Hearing someone's footsteps or hearing a person breathing on the other side of the door has so much tension to it. feel the tension of the world, make you question whether you want to engage with these guys or kind of try to stealth around them. That's another reason why we don't have traditional cover in the game. You smoothly move around everything, contextualizing with the environment, but you're never locked down. We want the player to, with that crafting system, with the scavenging system, with all of the abilities available to them, to constantly be moving around and changing as the moment arises. Gameplay is all about, I have a limited set of tools, and how am I going to use those tools and those limitations to overcome this obstacle in front of me? And that obstacle might be infected, might be another class of humans that wants to kill me for a bottle of alcohol in my shoes. It was important for us that we don't underplay the violence because then the threat doesn't seem as real. We see video games as this incredible uh, medium to tell stories. We want to treat it as uh, equals to books or comics or TV or movies. This is subject matter that would not be considered out of the ordinary to tell in one of those other forms of entertainment. Fucking honors. See, this could have been us. We wanted you to buy just the desperation of these people and why they're behaving this way because it's so brutal. And at the same time, we didn't want to make it so over the top, stylizing it so then it doesn't become as real. It was important for us actually to hit that middle ground where it's kind of disturbing. That glint that's happening on that curvature 
it'd be good if there was a way that we can guarantee that from this angle we're seeing it. it seems but really it's flat. overall too bright and opaque. Yeah, it looks like paint. Yeah, see the blood on the ground works really well. It's something about the the other shader is messed up in this environment. We got to fix that to unify the look. Shouldn't make you giggle or laugh or any of that. You should be kind of appalled by what you have to do, but you understand why you're doing it. You want to feel each hit. You want to feel each concussive strike. Lives are at stake. You want a death animation to have impactful performance, not just have a guy heal over your ragdoll. In real life, a guy hitting a guy takes a half a second, but in the game world, you want that to be as instantaneous as possible. I live my whole life in this very ugly test level. I basically just uh, fight dudes in here all the time. It, all, almost every move is divided between like an intro and a swing. And one of the many things I have to end up doing is like counting frames and being like, okay, on frame 18, I want you to get out of here. I want you to be able to start moving. Every hit reaction that an NPC plays, um, they are not necessarily in the correct pose. When you strike them the next time, we just pop them with a zero frame animation change, which is usually kind of a no-no, you know what I mean? Normally you want characters to blend smoothly and realistically into animations. But what we found is that um, you can cover that pop up with a heavy impact. They can go from almost any pose into the pose that the impact starts from and your eye just covers up the transition for you. So if you throw a brick at a guy, it puts him in this like kind of st staggering stun state. And that changes the moves that you do when you come up and punch him. So now I'm gonna come up and punch him. And now when you're punching him, because you've hit him down, you get this like auto aim moment where you get like a free headshot. I try to make it so that, you know, if you kind of know what you're doing, that you can set yourself up for one plus two equals three. Right here! Memory on a console is a, a very precious resource. All of Joel's animations with every weapon, all the NPC animations, the stealth kills, you know, all of that stuff happening need to fit within a four meg to five meg memory footprint. This is a list of everything that's loaded in game and how much memory it's taking because memory is our most precious resource right now. <laughs> So we have a level, uh, we call it the bookstore, it's in Hunter City, and this is a zone, for example. So when I set an AI to this zone, he will never leave its boundaries. I want guys to guard this exit where you have to go through, so I'll zone a couple guys around there to make sure that they, you know, they can fight you and use all this cover, but they want to stay around this door. This is another key component of the AI, is what we call the nav mesh. This defines the overall play space of where an AI knows he can or cannot go. Hey look, that's where a cover used to be, <laughs> and there's a hole cut out for it, I gotta fix that. Here's some other wonderful things. See these little red polygons? Yeah, that means they're not linking right for some reason, so that means they can't really walk through here properly. It's a bug, and I need to fix it. <laughs> Welcome to my life. look at a lot of games, NPCs are usually only alive for, you know, a few seconds before the player ends up shooting them and then they're dead. Uh, we want our guys to be much more dangerous and much more threatening, which means they have to be alive for longer, they need to uh, exist in the world for longer, which means you as the player can witness them acting out their uh, behaviors for longer. So we've been working uh, really hard on our AI systems. Back of the box, biggest bullet is going to be like AI. So we tried a number of different prototypes with the buddies, uh, including having Ellie be super independent of you. She would try to flank the enemies, get behind them, or get between you and them. And a lot of times those decisions should surprise you, just like a real person, a real character would surprise you. And we discovered after many different prototypes, the best thing for her to do generally is to stay very near you. You need the exploration, you need the scavenging, you need something to say like, okay, if we just crank it to 11 the whole time, then it's, it's pinned up there and there's no time to breathe, no time to assess or analyze, and no, no time to really contrast. There's no way of shifting the pacing.
puzzles are really weird, especially like Naughty Dog puzzles. I think they come, they're very simple and satisfying. Most of this puzzle is strict exploration. You can see the ladder here, you can see the pallet there, uh, you can see where you can see a clear route up to the ladder. So you're like, okay, maybe I have to get Ellie to the pallet, push the pallet over to this side, and like Ellie will climb up and lower the ladder. So that whole part is like, that's not a puzzle that's not regarded as a puzzle but when you feel like you've got to the solution and you're like okay I'm gonna climb this ladder and you climb it it breaks off hopefully then the player will feel a little bit stumped and they'll be like I'm not really sure what I am gonna do now and so this is where the puzzle starts hopefully at this point like all of the elements that the player needs to solve the puzzle are very familiar to them because they've been through the previous exploration beats they're improvising with elements that are at the disposal, that's a really sort of like strong theme throughout like The Last of Us. So like you're a survivor, you'll take whatever tools you're given and you'll use them in like creative ways to survive. set out to create something kind of new to Naughty Dog, uh, this crafting system. Our lead designer, uh, Jacob Minkoff, he got this book of like the survivalist handbook and homemade munitions and all sorts of funny stuff. Just start reading about, okay, if I was just wandering around in a collapsed society, this world, what stuff that seems like I could find? Alcohol and sugar, or, you know, if you want to make a smoke bomb. It's difficult to balance the right amount of resources against what you think the player's going to need and making sure that the player feels like they're getting just enough to survive, but not too much that they feel like they're a powerhouse. We wanted you to be forced to make some choices in the world that showed how depleted the resources were. So if there's a particular point in the story where the characters are having a particularly difficult time surviving, then we want you as the player to be finding fewer items, farther apart, harder to survive. We will item starve you at the same time that those, those characters are feeling starved and worn out. Then you expose something to them. Oh, here's a cache, and if I can just get into that cache. Oh, look, there's a wealth of things in here. God, I was so worried. My health was low. I, if, I, if I had run into a combat, because it's always that thing in your head, it's that Hitchcockian thing about the danger that you see is less meaningful than the danger that's in your head. When we're designing the levels, you know, it's nice to have the stuff that we know people are gonna encounter. You know, we kind of call this some of the critical path stuff. These are the things that nine out of 10 players are gonna find. They're right in the way, it's where you have to go. And then whenever designing a level, you wanna have that, that little nook and cranny, right? You wanna reward the player being like, oh, you went over here. And then you also wanna have that other second nook and cranny. The player is supposed to go place a ladder here and climb up through the rest of the hotel. But what they can also do is shimmy across this area and I place a really cool like upgrade um, kind of off the beaten path to reward players for exploring. So if they come all the way over here, they're gonna get this really cool training manual. It's a funny little bit of trivia, the actual, the HUD system, not the menus, not like when you hit start and stuff, but the actual HUD system where you see the reticles and stuff, was literally created for an E3 demo early in Uncharted 1, and that's been our HUD system, the foundation of our HUD system for the last four games. First time in Naughty history, we hired Alex. Uh, she's awesome. Uh, and she's got a really good understanding of UI and how it applies to games. The thing that I hate about any game's UI is when it pulls you out of the game for too long, no one wants to spend time in menus. Nobody loves UI, if we're being honest. <laughs> like, weapon slotting has probably gone through more iterations than any other system. The stuff that we finally ended up implementing, you press select, you get into this menu, then you D-pad uh, left and right through, this, through the slots, and then D-pad up and down will change the weapon, and then just you don't have to press X or anything, you just select out of it. When you're still, like Joel is here, that's fine, but then as soon as you get into an actual situation, so I'm gonna go over here and cause some trouble. Okay, so oh, here they come, oh god. All right, so now I'm out of ammo. Now I need to like get back in that menu. I have to like run away from them, get into the menu, get out of it. And it ends up feeling like super clunky. Like again, okay, I'm out of ammo again. 
get out of here. I need to take out one of my other long guns. And now Bill's in trouble. Bill's in trouble over here. And I've got to like, get, like I'm in a menu now and it's like, oh shit, whoever designed this UI is so bad. Like, what were they thinking? Bill's gonna die. In theory, it worked. But then in practice, it felt a little clunky. We wanted it to be the absolute minimum amount of button presses. You don't say to yourself, oh, I'm never gonna be able to do this in time, so I'm just going to give up. I'll die, I'll restart, let me try again. You wanna always make the player feel that there is a way to survive. They can just do this fast enough. And like, what's gonna go in now? If you just left right D-pad through this stuff, you swap out your guns, like between long gun and short gun. If you're now on this gun and you were to hold X to pick your gun, so it all happens within the same system that you're using to slot the weapons. The first iteration that I did on that was awful. It just took way too long <laughs> to get in. It, like, it was just a mess. QA was so upset at me like all the time. I should have hate me now because <laughs> of that system. I think the way the industry is kind of maturing and changing in general, you're seeing a lot more uh, focus and importance on refinement and polish. So having internal QA really helps. The industry is kind of changing from QA being this like, tighten up the graphics on level three bro kind of vibe to like really being a more technical, mental investigative job. On the publisher side, it's more reactive towards the code being delivered in a stable, controlled environment. Whereas on the developer side, um, especially at Naughty Dog, we are going beneath the art and the design. We're given enough weight where we can go up to somebody and be like, look, you have to fix this. Why come over, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. That kind of feedback, I would love to be able to say like, that was us, but it's, it gets so diffused throughout the iteration process that you really, you're just kind of like adding your, uh, I guess like genes into the gene pool and then just seeing what happens, you know what I mean? Everyone's working all the time now. Um, but like I, I told people, like seven weeks and then you can have tons of time off Enjoy the sun, you know? But for now, it's like, this is it for everybody. Crunching has been uh, it's part of making games. I feel it's human nature, right? If I'm gonna have a guest at home that's gonna come for a couple of weeks, I'm probably gonna clean their room just the day before they arrive, right? And I think it's the same thing. And it's just like everything comes together at the end. I personally enjoy crunch. I think you get this like absolute laser focus because it has to come together. There's uh, a camaraderie that also comes There's a camaraderie, totally, yeah. The vibe is everywhere, you know what I mean? Everyone's kind of like giving it 150% at this point. We're getting there, right? You start to get these glimmers, and I don't think anyone who doesn't make games realizes how late in the process you get those glimmers. One week before we shipped that press demo, we we're all like, this kind of sucks. What's going on here? It's like, we need to dig down and find this. And in one week, like one week, the fun came together. Like you're shooting at a guy and then somebody flanks you and you hit him and you avoid the other guy who's shooting you. And then you flank and go behind cover and you're like, oh, that five seconds in that 15 hour game was really, really fun. How do we make that five seconds happen thousands more times? My favorite video game is making video games. It is as challenging and as complex and as interesting. You know, if we had to like try all the things that didn't work, what's hard about crunch? It's like marching through that swamp of it not working. I mean, nothing's ever really final because you can always make something better, always. So we're constantly changing and constantly uh, reiterating and trying to make it better and better and better pretty much until we ship. As an artist, you're never really happy with, with your work. You could 
be given like a hundred years to work on something, you'll still find things to nitpick and things to fix. Yeah, you can work on the game for 10 years and you'll still be crunching at the end. <laughs> so it's like, okay. <laughs> All of a sudden it's like getting ready one morning in the shower and I was just like, oh yeah, I'm about to ship another title and this is gonna be a really good title. And it gets you excited and you're like, all right. Do I think the game's gonna be good? Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. I think it was good a little while ago and now we're gonna make it Extra kind good. of amazing. <laughs> yeah. What it will take to get there in these next five weeks is gonna be a lot. I'm excited, I, I have faith. Every time we're shipping a game, it's terrifying. You just hope for the best. You, you, you don't know, right? I mean, you, like people have different opinions. We have to go with our guts, but I trust the team just to pull it off. This, hands down, is the hardest, most challenging thing I've ever done. We sweat a lot, and we worked a lot, and we all went home tired, you know? Um, but I think that's what's, you're, you're gonna see that on the screen. I think that's gonna pay off. Ellie. Ellie. What? The ladder. Come on. Right. After David, Ellie's visibly distant. You could have done a cutscene to show, hey, you're being very distant, and she's not responding, but to also do that in gameplay to where it's something that you've done just countless times throughout the game with, you know, let me boost you up here, get the ladder, bring it down so we can do this systemic thing. And the character responds with that, and, and you have to actually go over to her and go, hey, come on, the ladder, we've, we've done this, let's do this. It's a, it's a subtle I choice. Like Bruce and I talked in the beginning, is like, we have these mechanics, how can we exploit them in a narrative sense? And that's one of those opportunities. And I just think it's incredible that that happens in-game. It's not a cinematic, you know? It's, it's something that adds weight to that controller when they're playing. Wow, so good! <laughs> Let's go eat. <laughs>